But, you know, we have been spending time looking at the pre-space age history of Mars exploration. You know, what could be determined through naked eye astronomy and telescopes and all that stuff. You know, really important for how we got to be where we are today. But, you know, I'm sure that the historical material is probably not really thrilling for a lot of you. Um, although I think it's, there's some interesting points there. Uh, showed the clips of the rocket launches today because we're now going to be moving into the space age. And what I want to begin with is particularly how the Mariner programs really changed our perceptions of Mars and actually whipped our perceptions of Mars back and forth a couple of times. Um, and frankly, we're still uh, you know, undergoing big changes in how we think about Mars with pretty much every new mission we send to the planet. So there's only so much you can do looking at Mars from uh, tens or hundreds of millions of miles away through a telescope. And uh, there's nothing like getting up close and personal uh, to get a better idea what's going on. And to do that, we had to wait for the, the space age to start. So what time period are we talking about now? Probably like the 1970s or 60s? 60s, yeah. So uh, I was a young whippersnapper at the time. Uh, but... Uh, so it's been quite a while ago. The Mariner program was uh, the U.S. and NASA's effort, basically, to open up the inner solar system. Okay, so these were our first forays to all of the terrestrial planets. Uh, first went to Venus with Mariner 1 and 2, except one didn't make it. Okay, anything that's in red there is uh, a failed mission. So we had um, Mariner 2 as a flyby mission of Venus. Mariner 3 didn't make it either. Um, it's the uh, fairing that protects the spacecraft as the rocket is, is accelerating up through the atmosphere. Never opened up. And if the fairing, this shell around the spacecraft, never opens up, then you can't get so sunlight on the solar panels. The spacecraft has no way to recharge its batteries, and it dies. And uh, basically, uh, well, yeah, well, Mariner 3 is dead. Mariner 4 was, uh, for our first successful mission to Mars, again, a flyby mission. Uh, why are our first missions flybys? We don't know the nature of the atmosphere yet. That's part of it. So you can get an idea of the terrain. So you can get an idea. Okay, this is a first reconnaissance, basically. Flybys are typically uh, first missions. Uh, and the primary reason is flybys are the easiest thing we can do. We lob a spacecraft out on an elliptical orbit. It follows Kepler's laws and we aim it correctly and it coasts past the planet. All we have to do is get it on its way and make sure it survives the seven to eight months that it takes to get to Mars and it can take observations as it goes by. Uh, six and seven were also uh, flyby missions to Mars. <coughs> Mariner 9 was our first uh, orbiter mission. And orbiter missions are the next step in difficulty. You not only have to accurately target your probe to meet up with the planet, but then you actually have to slow it down and get it into orbit once it gets there. Um, if you had an orbiter mission and you failed to do what you needed to do to get it in orbit, it would rapidly become a flyby mission. Um, Japan's first attempted orbital mission to Mars, or was it Venus? Japan has, has had some interesting problems uh, in terms of actually sticking the landing, um, but they've also been very 
um, tenacious about looping around the sun again to try again. Um, so in terms of the Mariner program to Mars, we've got four, six, seven, and nine. Okay. So Mariner 4, this is what uh, your basic spacecraft looks like. Uh, you can see some of the key parts here. You've got you know, a, a basic spacecraft bus, this platform that you hang all of your instruments on that provides power and um, uh, you know, pointing and so forth. Charles? All these go to my YouTube account, which I then embed the YouTube videos into the Moodle pages. So if you go back to the class sessions pages in a couple of days, you'll see the, the lectures. Uh, what, what are these things over here? Flat panels. Solar arrays, okay. So, uh, you know, in order to keep the instruments powered up, uh, you need some kind of source of energy and uh, plenty of sunlight out in space, at least in the inner solar system. So we've got these solar uh, arrays. What does this look like up here? An antenna, okay. Spacecraft doesn't do much good if you can't communicate back to Earth. So, uh, I mean, you basically have the bus, you've got the instruments, you've got the power source, uh, you've got to maintain uh, appropriate heat balance. Uh, actually, one of the issues spacecraft have is to avoid overheating. You, all, we all think of space as being this cold place, but the only way you can get rid of heat uh, out in space because you're in a vacuum is to radiate the heat off. Okay, there's no gentle breezes that are going to come by and cool you off if you get too hot. So uh, if you've got you know, solar arrays that are specifically designed to absorb as much sunlight as possible, oftentimes you have to worry about how, what kind of radiation, radiator system can you set up in order to manage uh, shunting off heat. So we had a basically a... Um, Analog TV camera, which is the technology of the time, uh, that would save um, information about light and dark pixels onto a digital tape recorder with the capacity to store about 20 pictures as the probe goes by the planet. Uh, there is a dust collector, plasma, radiation, etc., uh, magnetic fields, there's a magnetometer that can respond to any kind of applied magnetic field that the spacecraft is experiencing. And again, this was a flyby for July 1965. Just a quick schematic that actually labels some of these things. Um, you can take a look at this uh, picture from the slides later to, to see more exactly what we're talking about. But the camera is mounted underneath the spacecraft bus. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got um, some sensors here that allow the spacecraft to know where it is in space by tracking particular bright stars, by looking for the planet. Uh, and so forth, and then there are, there's the plasma probe, cosmic dust collector, and so forth. So this is the flyby, which means you've got one shot to collect data. So after coasting through space for seven-ish months, um, the spacecraft either has to wake up or it has to be woken up, and the instruments still have to work after being exposed to the temperature extremes of space, and they had to be turned on at the right time. Spacecraft has to be pointed at the planet at the right time, and the camera has to be commanded to start taking pictures. The tape recorder has to be commanded to start running. Uh, lots of things can go wrong. Okay. So this was a fairly easy question in the self-check um, quiz. What 
did Mariner 4 see when it ran, went past Mars? Craters. And more craters. And more craters. Um, how did Mariner 4 measure the, like the, I forgot the word. Like, <laughs> Which? Magnetic field. Yeah, the magnetic field. Um, <laughs> We'll have a lecture on magnetic fields where I've got a nice video showing you how you develop a magnetometer to measure magnetic fields. So let's put it off till then. Okay, thank you. So you, you, you read about this, um, that the main uh, result of the Mariner missions were Mars looks like craters, but I thought it'd be worthwhile just to show you what it actually looks like. So this is the first picture returned from Mars. What do you see? What? Pretty? It's pretty grainy. Yeah, are these clouds? What are the, you, you can see some light and some dark. Can we tell if this is dust or not? Okay. So, you know, you wait seven and a half months, and it took probably 10 hours to download the data for this picture, pixel by pixel over the radio communications at the time. If you actually look at that second Mariner 4 uh, video clip that I've got in the class page, it actually shows an old uh, teletype kind of printer printing out line after line, here's this pixel, and here's a value between 0 and 63. You know, 0 is white. All the white parts there are zeros that came down from the spacecraft. All the black, black parts are 63s, and anything gray in between was a 27 or a 35 or whatever. The researchers were so impatient that they drew a grid you know, representing the pixels, what would be there. And as the numbers printed out, they drew a black square or left it white or shaded it in just to get an idea of, you know, what was coming on. This is uh, quite a bit different than uh, what we uh, have available to us today. Okay, so first picture, you know, it's closer image than what we saw in the telescopes, but uh, not real great. But here's maybe a little bit uh, more realistic uh, example of the kind of pictures that we get from Mariner 4. Now what do you see? Craters. craters. Okay. So that looks like a crater. Now, and that looks like a crater, and that looks like a crater. Um, here, here, here. Are these volcanoes? Are these impacts? Yeah, that was a big question back then. We know that the surface is cratered, but what does it actually, what does it actually mean? Here's another spot on the track. Crater, crater, crater. Uh, okay. And again, here's a relatively big one. And here are two of the images stitched together, cleaned up a little bit. Uh, what features do you see in this landscape? It's the same answer. Craters. craters. <laughs> do you see anything other than craters in this, in this landscape? No. Do you see mountain ranges like the Alps or the Andes Mountains? Do you see, do you see canals? No. Do you see Martian cities? No. I mean, clearly Mariner 4 drove a stake in the heart of Lowell's image of Mars. More craters. This is not Mars. This is the moon. We know the moon is full of craters. If Mars is full of craters, what does that make us think about Mars? Probably pretty dead. The, yeah. 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 Uh, we, we know nothing really has happened on the moon in a big way for billions of years. If Mars is looking like the moon, then Mars all of a sudden becomes a lot duller 
more boring than it was when Lowell was creating his story about ancient civilizations. A moon is an object that's not in orbit around the sun. So we have one moon that orbits the Earth. The Earth orbits the sun, right? Mars orbits the sun. Mars has two moons that orbit it. Um, that you know, two reasonably sized moons. They're kind of like asteroid sizes, uh, Phobos and Deimos. Mercury has no major moon orbiting it. <coughs> Venus has no major moon orbiting it. Uh, Jupiter has, I forget the last count, 80, 90 moons, four of which are large enough for Galileo to see through his telescope, but if you actually look, there, there are uh, dozens of moons orbiting Jupiter and Saturn, and to some extent Uranus and Neptune. Now Pluto, which is not a planet anymore, which is a dwarf planet, has a moon that is a significant fraction of its size, and to the extent that both Pluto and Charon, its moon, quote-unquote moon, orbit a common point out in space. So they're kind of looping around each other. Um, so it's... Sharon is small enough that it's not you. Know, you wouldn't consider it a binary planet system. It's still it's still you know significantly smaller than Pluto, but it's massive enough that the common center of uh, rotation is actually outside of, of Pluto. Um, how much bigger is Jupiter than Earth? Well, we looked at uh, that in the scale of the solar system. Um, I don't have that figure off the top of my head, but if you could fit. Easily thousands of Earths within this volume of Jupiter. Okay, so some basic other science results besides these depressing pictures of craters. Um, the atmosphere was even thinner than was predicted. So all through the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, Conditions on Mars kept getting crappier and crappier the more we studied them. You know, it's not that Mars was changing, but our understanding of how crappy Mars was, was developing. Okay. You know, initially, people thought, well, maybe Mars is like you're up on the top of a high mountain, the atmosphere is a little thin, it's cold, and so forth. Uh, but the more we studied the atmosphere of Mars from Earth through telescopes, the more it was clear that the atmosphere was significantly thinner than the atmosphere on the Earth. When, um, when uh, Mariner 4 passed behind Mars, JPL could record the intensity of the radio waves as the, plan as the probe was approaching the planet. So the radio waves would have been going through the atmosphere and how much the radio waves were attenuated and bent by the atmosphere allowed them to more precisely measure how thick the atmosphere is. That's what this radio occultation experiment was about. So occultation just means you've got one celestial body going behind the other. In this case, it's our spacecraft going behind Mars. And the effect of Mars' atmosphere on the radio waves tells us, or told us, that um, Mars' atmosphere was even less than we thought, you know, less than 1% that of Earth's daytime temperatures, which were measured by uh, instruments on the spacecraft, <coughs> were in the areas that uh, were being measured, you know, more than, around a minus 100 degrees uh, Celsius. No magnetic field, which means Mars is just exposed to the magnetic uh, to the solar wind, and so you know this is the depressing view of Mars after Mariner Four, that it's you know kind of like the Moon, but it's got a little bit of atmosphere to blow the dust around, and so it's uh, you know maybe there's a little bit more going on than on the Moon, but uh, pretty bad. Okay, uh, I think I'll actually blow through Mariner 6 and 7 relatively quickly. Again, they were both flyby missions. Similar kinds of spacecraft bus 
uh, solar arrays, antenna instruments, and so forth. Some new instruments, though, uh, like this ultraviolet spectrometer and the infrared spectrometer. You know, these are instruments that uh, take a look at some object that's giving off light, break the light down into different wavelengths to see what that object is doing in terms of absorbing or emitting the different wavelengths of light. It allows us to identify compositions of rocks, minerals, atmosphere, gases, and so forth. Um, so this would have been two launch windows later. So there were no Mars probes during the intervening launch window. Again, similar kind of spacecraft bus. Um, Mariner 6 and 7 essentially saw the same kind of terrain that Mariner 4 saw. Uh, I mean, Mariner 4 only looked at like 1% of the surface of Mars. So there was a little bit of hope that, well, you know, maybe we're just looking at the, the dull part of Mars. And so now we've got two more flyby missions and they essentially see the same thing. So this pretty much just kind of reinforces the idea that Mars is dead. Here are the spacecraft tracks. Uh, more craters. More craters and the uh, polar cap, southern polar cap. More craters. Uh, so again, it's mostly cratered views. There looks like there's some weathering going on, but you would expect that because there is a little bit of an atmosphere, so there would be, over billions of years, some wind erosion that would take the craters and soften them off and, you know, erode them a little bit. However, there were some areas that were smooth, and if you look at an area and it's smooth and doesn't have a lot of craters in it, what does that mean? In terms of its age? It's, um, it's young. It's got to be younger. Okay. Anything that's old will have been around long enough to accumulate massive whaps from space. Okay. Boom, crater, boom, crater. So if you've got areas that are smooth, something has happened, uh, and we know particularly early in the solar system there were a lot of, of impacts as the solar system was getting cleaned up of all the debris. So if you've got smooth areas, then <coughs> something has happened in the last three and a half billion years to resurface that area. There, there's this chaotic terrain that they had no idea what was going on. Again, no mountain chains, no valleys. Does that mean that Mars doesn't have plate tectonics um, you know, pushing continental crust around? Like <coughs> um, Again, by using the uh, infrared spectroscopy, you're able to identify different kinds of gases in the atmosphere. Primarily what Mariner 6 and 7 saw was the abundance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, there's some traces of water vapor, some ice crystals, not a lot of detection of <coughs> ozone. And if we don't see ozone, um, that means there's probably not a lot of oxygen gas in the atmosphere. Um, dry ice, water, ice crystals, dust were the kinds of clouds that, that were seen. So this really bummed people out, right? We finally have a chance to explore Mars. It's this, this, our exciting neighbor planet, and our first visits to the place really show us that there's not anything really interesting going on there. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, we have this arc of Mars first becoming a world, and people like Herschel saying, well, the people who live on Mars must have a situation very similar to what we experience because of the day length and the seasons and the polar caps, and, you know, these inhabitants of Mars must have a world kind of like ours, you know, and that reaches its zenith with a low view of Mars as this dying planet with the ancient civilization. Then, as we study the planet more and more through telescopes, we think, well, it's 
highly unlikely that Mars ever supported advanced life, but you know maybe there's an environment that will allow lichens to live. You know, we know it's cold, we know it's dry, but lichens can live under those conditions. And then, you know, we see, well, you know, maybe bacteria. By the time we get to early Mariner, uh, Mars looks like the moon, and we have no in idea that the moon has, you know, any potential for life at all. So, it's actually very surprising. You know, if Mariner 9 and 8 had not been in the pipeline, at this point, I'm not sure that they would have been approved. Um, but uh, Mariner 9, again, first, um, first orbiter mission. Similar kinds of, of instruments. Now we're talking about getting into the 70s. So this was actually the, the next launch window after uh, Mariner 6 and 7. And... Uh, Eight and nine had to be massive because what makes it so difficult, at least early in the uh, exploration of the solar system, is that you, you need to have a lot of fuel to slow down and be captured by Mars. Um, we're a little bit more efficient now because we can send our spacecraft screaming through the upper atmosphere of Mars to kind of bleed off some of the velocity. But, uh, you know, all of the increase in payload for 8 and 9 essentially went to extra fuel so that they could slow down at Mars. Okay. Uh, kind of similar spacecraft bus. So, <clears throat> curious uh, story about Mariner 9. Mariner 8, again, failed. Uh, so Mariner 9 had to do both the work of Mariner 8 and the work of Mariner 9. So it was kind of a compromise between the goals of the two. Um, but in 71, when Mariner 9 arrives in orbit, Mars is shrouded by one of the largest global uh, dust storms that had been seen for decades. At the same time, the Soviets launched Mars 2 and 3, which were also both orbiter missions. They arrived at the same time with the same problem. We were lucky in that Mariner 9 was a programmable spacecraft, so JPL could send commands to, okay, nothing to see now, just kind of hunker down, save your fuel, we'll wait to see what we can see when the dust storm clears. Uh, Mars 2 and 3 from the Soviet Union were pre-programmed to go through their routine of collecting data, so they arrived collected all these images, all of their instrument observations while the planet is in the middle of this global dust storm. Um, and they basically ran their course well before the dust cleared. So the Soviet Union and subsequently Russia has had a really tough time with Mars. Um, they haven't really had a, a notable success. They've been much more successful with their probes to Venus than we've been, but, um, yeah. But, okay, so here's an early picture from orbit. What do you see? You see three somethings. Okay, and what, what do you mostly see? Yeah, so mostly it's a featureless sphere because it's, you know, atmosphere is just thick with all this dust. People realize, researchers realize fairly early though that these three splotches and another one that would have been over here um, had to be massive structures if they're poking their heads up out of the dust. Because with the, lower, with the lower gravity on Mars, the dust storms on Mars go to a much higher uh, elevation than any of our weather here on the Earth. So for these things to be kind of poking out at this point mean, meant they must have been just massive structures. So uh, when the dust finally cleared, 
uh, Mariner 9, because it was in orbit and not just flying by, had a chance to actually map the whole planet and actually see some of the interesting <coughs> terrain that was missed by 4, 6, and 7. We just had really dumb luck with how we targeted 4, 6, and 7 to go past the planet. All three of them went past the most dead terrain on Mars. So Mariner 9 sees volcanoes. This volcano is, anyone have a guess as to what this volcano is? Olympus. Olympus, Olympus Mons. The base of Olympus Mons, as you can see here, uh, would cover the state of Washington. The comparison that's usually made is, is about as big as the state of Arizona. So imagine the state of Arizona being one shield volcano. Okay. Now Olympus Mons is the tallest volcano in the solar system. We have uh, these three... Um, Tharsis Montes volcanoes, which uh, are in about that orientation to Olympus Mons in the western hemisphere of Mars. These are shield volcanoes, very much like uh, the Hawaiian Islands are shield volcanoes. They're fairly um, shallow slope, <coughs> large base. Um, you can see that there are multiple calderas here that have been active over time in the case of Olympus Mons. So, huge volcanoes. You know, Tharsis, Tharsis, Tharsis Montes. Montes is the plural of Mons. Um, Mons is just mountain. Um, so we've got that. This is not the best picture of it, but this is a Mariner 9 image of Valles Marineris. So we're talking about visiting the Grand Canyon, which is this dinky little canyon in Arizona. Valles Marineris would stretch from the west coast to the east coast of the United States. What was probably more interesting were all of these, not canals, but different kinds of channels and uh, uh, other linear features that look like they're carved into the landscape. We've got you know valley networks that could be either kind of stubby and un fairly unbranched you know, with some minor branches or tributaries here. But some of these valley, valley network systems have extensive um, levels of, of branching channels that appear to be coming together, uh, pointing toward the down slope direction. What features on Earth does this remind you of? Where do we see this kind of dendritic branching pattern of channels on the landscape here on Earth. What? Mississippi River. River, river yeah. So these look like river basin channels, tributary systems. Is there any water in them? No. Okay. We know that Mars can't support liquid water today. Uh, so, you know, the big question is, well, you know, how did these form if, if Mars can't support rivers today? A lot of interest in, well, maybe Mars was a nicer place in the past, and if so, can we understand how and why? Other kind of channel systems uh, that are more massive structures that look like what you'd expect from a flooding situation. We'll talk more about this when we do talk about the history of water and climate on Mars. But some of that chaotic terrain, where it looked like the landscape had just kind of fractured and collapsed and so forth, uh, those pictures of chaotic terrain that we saw in Mariner 6 and 7, 
we now seem to be associated with some of these massive outflow channels. So what, if that's your observation, what interpretation could you apply to that? That there was water underground somehow, and it got released, rushed out, carved this channel, and the surrounding terrain then just kind of collapsed. Um, not exactly like a sinkhole in Florida, but you know similar kinds of things. If you you had ice and water, and that material all rushed out, then you're likely to get to collapse. Now, you know, these are interpretations. They're interpretations we'll talk about when we talk about water um, later in the, in the semester. Um, better picture of the polar caps. We'll have more to say about those later. <coughs> so, uh, and again, some, some science results. Um, detection of carbon monoxide and some oxygen radicals, carbon dioxide, um, you know, they were able to get basically more, um, more detailed observations on the atmosphere and so forth. But, uh, you know, none of the observations of Mariner 9 of modern day Mars makes us think, woohoo, Mars is, you know, this really active um, planet today. What, what uh, Mariner 9 really did was to make us think, um, Mars might have been a more interesting planet in the past. And if it was more interesting, if it was wetter, it had to have been warmer. If it was warmer and wetter, maybe it was suitable for life in the past. So uh, although Lowell was mis... Um, I don't want to say misguided. Although Lowell was you know, not really correct in the way he was arguing that M Mars was a dying planet, um, in some respects, we are now thinking that Mars was more Earth-like in the past and has gotten to be in the state it's in over time. Um, I mean, since I showed the clip of Elon Musk earlier, Musk calls Mars a real fixer-upper of a planet. Uh, it's uh, kind of run down uh, compared to its former glory. And, um, and we really want to know why. What happened? Why did, uh, why did Mars go on a different path than the Earth? Um, so, I've kind of already covered this. Um, by, by having the ability to put Mariner 9 in orbit, rather than just fly by, we actually got a better view of how there were actually interesting parts of the planet, and that uh, historically, in its early past, uh, Mars might have been a much more Earth-like planet. <clears throat>